Okay, so someone share with this Kunstlinger. We are on page five of the book. Yeah, no, um, the first page is just re uh, rehashing a summary, which is helpful, but not for now. You can go, don't worry. Okay, so the, the Gemara asked the following question about this Megillah story. The Gemara asks, Esther mina turbanayin. Where can you find Esther in the Torah? Why is that an unusual question to ask? What? Oh, that's very sweet. Why is that an unusual question to ask? Where is Esther in the Torah? Yes. Because the Megillah was written after the Torah was completed. Absolutely. It's a very unusual thing to ask. What do you think it means? Focus. What do you think the, the, the Gemara is asking Wait, over here? Really the question is, Esther in the Torah 9. Where can you find Esther in the Torah? And it's even answered, by the way. It's actually a quote, an entire Pasuk verse from the Bible to prove it. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Story took place after, so they meant. No, they want to know where she is implanted. Yeah. What does that mean? But it asks for her. It's actually asking for her. Okay, so I think we're going to go with. It's definitely going to involve Hester Panim, you're absolutely correct. But as well as that, there's going to be a hint to her as well. In other words, everything that's ever happened in creation, there's a premise over here. And the premise is everything that happens in creation, every event, every story, according to many people, every name, can be found in the Torah itself. Because the Torah is the blueprint. Therefore, this major episode that happens to the entire Jewish people must have been hinted. And it is hinted as part of the prophecy of... Whose prophecy is the Torah? No, whose prophecy is it? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was the, was the Navi. The Torah, the five books of Moses, means the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's the answer it gives. It says right towards the end of the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, Devarim, 31.18, Lamed Aleph Yud Chet, it says the following. And this is Moshe Rabbeinu speaking to the Jewish people. Remember, the, all of Devarim is one long speech, which lasts like a few weeks, which Moshe Rabbeinu is giving the Jewish people before they enter into the land of Israel, because he was not going to be able to enter into the land of Israel, right? Okay, so he says to them, there's gonna be a time in history where it's not gonna be very easy to find me. I'm going to hide myself. What that means we're gonna see. Va'anochi Hashem. He's saying it via Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is warning the people, there's gonna be times in history where you're not gonna see Hashem's hand. Where is this? In Deuteronomy, chapter 31. Verse 18, we're on page 5. Vanochi hastir astir panai biyamahu. I am going to hastir astir. What do those words mean? Surely hide panai my face. Remember, if a word is capable, it's mentioned twice, it means really, really. Right? Not so simple, it's like really going to hide my face. You're not going to be able to see me. What does his face mean? What does what, what, God doesn't have a face? What does that mean? Okay, what does a face do? It reveals everything, you, right? All of your feelings towards someone, right? Your face. You don't look, if you don't know how someone's doing, you don't look at their hand or their knee or their foot. Look at their face. The face shows the expression of what a person's thinking about you. If a person, even in English works, if I'm hiding my face from you, what am I saying to you? I'm not going to show you how I feel, exactly. So God says, I'm going to, there's going to be a time in Jewish history I'm going to hide my face. That's at the time of Esther. Esther represents the time. So this is actually a prophecy, say, says Chazal, say the rabbis, that this is a reference to the time of the Megillah that we've looked at. So this one verse is referring to the time of Purim, referring to the time of Purim. Okay, and that posse is behind me. So Hastir, 
is a reference to Esther, which means hidden, which we mentioned already wasn't really her name. Her name was Hadassah, as the Megillah itself tells us. Let's have a look a little bit further into this. Look inside your books, please. We're looking at Rosh Shimshon Pincus, and he gives a nice little summary of this idea. And he says, Zoe Gamasiba, this is the reason, we're on note two, on page five, Lekach Shalom Muskar, that, Bochala Megillah, that God's name is not mentioned Avshem Hashem is Hashem is Brach at all, even once. The only book in all the scriptures where God's name is not even mentioned. What do God's name represent? God's name is God revealing Himself. Right? God's name of God's attributes, how God relates to the world and how He relates to us. That's what God's names are. We name Elohim is the God's name of justice, of din. God's name of Yud Kei Vav Kei is God's mercy. Kel Shakai, God's of control creates the world. None of that is mentioned. It's, what does that mean? God is hiding his face from us. Because had God mentioned his name in the Megillah, this would have been God removing himself from the from the Geder, the fencing in of Teva. Now, what is Teva exactly, besides a shoe company, which everyone seems to buy on the year course, and a um, pharmaceutical company, actually, it does very well. What is Teva? Very interesting word, Teva. Yeah. So we translate it as nature, right? What does nature connote? What is the idea of nature? That God's in there. That all there is is nature. Things just happen naturally. There is no guide, right? That's why people say, well, you know, the atheists will say, Mother Nature. Right? That, that's the way of saying, and I they can't say God, so I'll say Mother Nature. That'll be their way of saying it. But the word Teva has actually got a depth to it. The word Teva is related to another couple of words. Anyone know? Which are related to this idea. Remember, they have the same showresh, the same root. We're dealing with ideas that are interchangeable. So the word Teva, nature, where God hides himself, as you very well said, Shifra, Hashem hides himself in nature. Our job is to pierce through nature. Hashem clothes himself in nature. Right? The idea of clothing. So nature itself is God's Purim outfit. He hides himself. So the word Teva is related to another word, which is Tavu, which is to sink, to sink in. It's another word you can see in the word Teva, to sink. Right? The Ark of Noah was sunken in. Oh, it's something sinks in. Why is that? Because a person could sink into nature and think this is all there is. Right? You could fall for it and believe, hey, what is there? Ah, there is only nature. There is nothing else. There is no guiding hand of the entire world. You need to sink in, to lose yourself. Another word, though, is a matbeah. What is matbea? What is a matbea? A matbea is actually a coin. One of the old words for a coin, a matbea. Why would the word for coin be the same as nature? Well, what does a coin get its worth from? From the imprint that's upon it, right? It's embossed with an imprint of a king or a queen or a president or whatever, right? So that imprint is what gives a value, besides the inherent value, but it gives a value as a source of currency. So nature is actually Hashem's imprint on the world, which means you can see Hashem's print by looking at nature. You can look at the natural world, and you are able to see God, although God is hidden in the world. Hashem is hidden, He's sunken inside. Still, there is an imprint. You can see godliness, if you will, imprinted on nature. Yeah. We're going to make that connection right now. We have to go out and we're going to bring it back in. Okay? So let's do that together. Can everyone see the, th the two interpretations? So Teva is nature. Right? Hashem hides himself in, in nature. He sinks himself, as it were, inside. As well as that. But still there is a possibility, the imprint of Hashem. What has that got to do with Purim? Well, it's actually got to do a lot to do with Purim. And even more to do with Pesach. Because those two things are going to represent two ways Hashem revol, um, reveals Himself to us. So He says, 
for Pesach. Hashem reveals himself in external fashion miraculously. That's called a nes nigla. Nes nigla. And that is typified by Pesach. Pesach is all about Hashem revealing himself, no doubts, miraculously, sea splitting, ten plagues, everything's out. Hashem is obviously there and very, very present. That's one way Hashem reveals himself to us. Nes nigla. There's another way where Hashem does not remove himself from nature. What does that mean? Pesach is Hashem removing himself from nature. The laws of nature longer, no longer apply. Hashem allows his presence to be felt outside of nature. That's referred to as miracles. Nes. Actually, that's also a good word to talk about for a second. We're going to talk about the Pesach as well. Nes means miracle, but it also means a, a flag. A flag. Many times in, in, in Tanakh, a nes refers to a flag. Why? Or a banner. Why is that? Why is, a, why is a miracle the same word for a flag or banner? And it's when you're, like declaring the territory. you're declaring territory. This is where something happened. It's revealed. A flag says, this is where that event occurred. So nes means miracles. Two types of nes. Nes nigla. And then nes. Nistar. There it is. The hidden miracle. So we see two types of miracle. The Pesach, where Hashem reveals himself and goes above nature. Lamala mina teva. Lamala means above teva. But there's another version, which is Hashem hiding himself inside nature. And that's Purim. And that's Purim. That's Nes Nistar. Yeah? And as he says, Ach, but Purim, Megala Lanu, we learn, so we learn something on Pesach, as we're going to learn after we learn Purim. But we learn that on Pesach, Hashem controls nature and is above nature. But there's another aspect to the way God relates to us, which is the Anochi Hastir Aster Panai version. And that is, that everything happens within nature, i.e. without miracles, inside the natural cycle of events that occur to us in this world. The darkness, it's referred to as darkness. Because right? when things are dark, you can't see. Hashem does not reveal himself in it. Zui Piskat Ava. That's actually considered to be greater than Pesach. Nes Nistar is better. Why would Nes Nistar, hidden miracle, which we still have today, right? revealed miracle stopped at around the Hanukkah time. That was actually probably the last open miracle that happened to the Jewish people. But hidden miracles we still have. Why is a hidden miracle considered to be greater than an open miracle? Why do you think that... There's a greater affection that is built up through that. Um, it, takes, like, effort to it takes effort to believe. Very, very good. It takes more work. You have to work hard to see Hashem. Hashem's face is not available to be shown. Hashem's name is being revealed. You've got to work hard in order to do it. That's what he says next. Where do you see more love? Purma Pesach. Meaning, above it or inside it. Bachaga Pesach, Harimotana Koshbok Mel Olam, on Pesach, we see Hashem controlling the entire world, above miraculously, there's no doubt, it's very clear. Aval Bapurim, Anu Megalim, we reveal, Eta Koshbok, Bachon, the Kuda, Unakuda, Shel Teva. We see Hashem at every single point within nature. So the Purim story, if you remember, we went through five classes of Delvi inside it. What did we see? We saw coincidence after coincidence, just natural events just happening again and again and again. Esther happens to be chosen, Vashi happens to get killed, ha- um, Mordechai happens to overhear. Ahashvero, she gets angry. We see all these events, and Mordechai happens to tell over, and, he t- and it happens to be the right place at the right time. It's all natural. Our job on Purim is to see Hashem within the natural. That's much harder than seeing a sea split in front of your eyes, but we consider that to be greater. That's a greater miracle. So much so that something incredible is going to happen. We'll see that in a few moments. Now, what it's going to say now is that all of this can actually be summed up in the word poor. Pei vavresh. For purim. Why? Nukurzet tumuna. This idea, this point, is captured, is captured, gam be'etzem shema umuhusol yom zeh. In the name itself, every name of every holiday is going to reveal the essence of that holiday. So, what's Pesach? 
Pesach means to? Passover, right. Pesach means Passover. Why? Who passed over what and why? Hashem passed over the homes we're going to see of the Jewish people in order for the tenth plague and spared them, yet the Egyptian firstborns were killed. Okay, that's called miraculous. That doesn't actually happen. So Pesach, the idea we'll see more behind that, Pesach is going to represent that idea of God's revelation in this world in an overt manner. Purim, however, comes to the word poor. What has that got to do? Shalachoyra ain't davar tevio temigoral. There's nothing more natural than a goral. What's a goral? A lottery. A goral is a lottery. Now remember, Haman did a lottery. He was Mr. Lottery. Nothing more natural than that. olam is a petechad. It's a goral. What happens? You got all the numbers, or all the ping pong balls with numbers on inside a big box, and they're pulled out randomly. That's like completely natural. We have no idea who's going to win. It's all natural. It's all random. Poor means lottery, i.e., randomness. You would have thought that it happens to be that this petak, this piece of paper, this ping pong ball number, just is pulled out and everything is random. But that's not the case. That is not the case. Olam, however, we see that a goral in the Torah itself is proof of God's providence, of God's hashgacha, of God's control over. Let's have a look what we see there. dugmad Torah we see in Torah and in the prophets. And Roim, we're on top of page six. Kiadaraba, the exact opposite. Goral who bitoy lepuula shalakarosh parach b'chavodavatzma. Hashem uses a goral to show that he actually controls. Where do we see this? The very famous, I don't know the most famous story of a lottery in the Torah, in the five books of Moses itself. Where it was, I'll show you, it was picked out of the Torah, but actually came into effect later on when the Jewish people entered into Eretz Yisrael. <coughs> Not just the Levim. Dividing the land, yes, yes, yes. When was the, the land divided? In the time of, who was the leader at that point? Yoshua. The Jewish people entered into Israel, 40 years after leaving Egypt, the Jewish year 2488, seven years of Kephisha, seven years of war, and then seven years of Chalukah, seven years of division. Okay. We fought for seven years, the different nations that were there are going to attack us, or didn't leave, and we divided for seven years as well. How do we know who got what portion of land? Who said who got, you know, the, the land by the sea, the land next to Yerushalayim, the land down south, the land Transjordan, all these different areas, who decided? Everyone, believe me, each tribe wanted the right piece. So interestingly enough, it had to seem random as if there was no, but Hashem decided who it was, and it was actually miraculous. Inside the lottery were miracles where names were called out, and the right tribe pulled out their name as well. And he says, The tribes received their land via Goral. Every tribe said, Oh, I wish I had that. And each one wished actually for their own portion they ended up with. Right? And Mufharim, the best one. Kagon Liada Yam, right next to the sea. They said, You know what? We want Hashem to choose for us. Right? We don't trust that it's going to be fair. It's going to be our land forever. Right? This is going to be our land. Our piece of land within Israel. What did he do? He chose a goral. He chose a lottery. A lottery seems random. It seems like, it seems like no one's getting preference over another. But in the end, the Baruch Hu used that as a way. So this, he says, is the essence of Purim. Shel Pur. Zua Mitzvah Roshon Shel Purim. And this is actually the first mitzvah of Purim. Create a Megillah. She Megala. What is the Megillah? The word Megillah means scroll. But it also means to Megala. Megala is to reveal. The word Megala means reveal. So Hashem is revealing himself, Megala, through the Megillah. It seems the Megillah is controlling the event, but Hashem is Megala. These words are important. 
Hashem is actually revealing to us through the Megillah, through a scroll of his essence in this world. And the word, word Olam comes from the word Helam, which means hidden, because God is hidden in this world. That's God's nature, unless he decides to remove himself from nature to reveal himself. Are we getting the pattern over here? Are we following it? Yeah? We good? Yeah. What did you say with the essence of Purim? So the essence of Purim is it seems like a goral, it seems like a lottery, but actually Hashem is revealing himself through the lottery. Because remember, Haman did a lottery. Okay? So Hashem is saying, this world is like a poor, but don't make the mistake of being sunken into it, because Hashem is lamalam in a teva. So even in natural events, we see Hashem. Hashem is Megaleh in the Megillah. Yeah? That's why it says the Maharal, in Teferit Yisrael, top of 53, this is page 6, note 4, Am Yisrael, Lemisa, when Hashem decided that the Jewish people should be exterminated, because that was the decision, until we did repentance that turned it around, that turned it around, then Nechshav Lemisa as Mamish. It was like Hashem, it was like we were dead. Once Hashem decided we were dead, that's it, we were dead. After this, Hashem created a new nation in Kabbalah Torah, with a new receiving of the Torah, as we're going to see, as is going to be mentioned, interesting enough, in the Megillah itself. So through this whole thing, Hashem was able to create, we were so scared, Hashem was so hidden, and we were so nervous about the events, and the fact we were about to be annihilated, because Hashem had decided we were going to be annihilated for eating, at the feast of Achashverosh, Hashem said, don't worry, you do tshuva, we do repentance, it all turned around, and we were like a new nation. So Chag Purim, so the story of Purim, note six, last paragraph, Megale Lan reveals to us, Lorak et avat gedola, not just the great love, Shehit Oru B'Shasakana, which comes out of danger, Ella et Kalmadullah, but actually everything in this world. This story of Purim is going to reveal something about the nature of Olam Hazer of this world. Et Mashakalachad Sarech Lachshom. Everyone's got to think about Kashu Shose Kosmayim. Every time he says Shakal Nibavra, you drink a cup of water, make a bracha before you drink it. This is what you may think. What's that? That a Karsh Barcho is hiding himself in every hidden aspect of this world which Purim is the quintessential story about. It comes, this is the proof text, this idea. HaMegillah Megalo, the Megillah is Megalo, the Megillah reveals at HaKrava Kedola B'yotek Rosh Baruch Hashem's closeness, HaKem B'olam HaTeva, right, and presence in the world of nature. HaOtzmesh Al Purim named Sefer Teva. So Purim is found in nature. So working out to find a Rosh Baruch in it is even greater. Turn over the page, if you will. We're on page seven. That was page six. Yeah. Now we're going to jump to page seven, note six. This is Rav Hutton, and he gives a mashal, a mashal. And he, we'll do this one in the English, but Rav Hutna, who spoke up, I wrote a good book on Purim, says, let me give you an analogy, a metaphor for this. Let's try to understand this analogy. He said, you basically have two people are given a job of recognizing people at night. They're night watchmen, okay? That's their job. And the first one used the flashlight so he could see the faces of the people. Okay, so two people are night watchmen. One's given a flashlight. The other one, however, didn't have a flashlight. So how's he gonna recognize people? He can't see them. He's gonna have to learn how to hear their voices. When he hears their voices, he's going to be able to identify them. Okay? So we have two night watchmen, one's with a flashlight, one hasn't. The one with a flashlight can see, but the one without is going to have to use some other faculty and he starts to recognize voices to know who's coming. So which one has a greater level of clarity? So you would have thought, well the first guy has because he can see the people. But actually the second person has an advantage of the first. The guy who learns to recognize voices using the power of listening is going to end up greater. Why? Because the next morning, everyone's got light. The light shines and everyone can see. But the guy who listens has now developed a new faculty. In the darkness, he learned to recognize it, to use a new faculty of listening. They say blind people have a higher, more acute 
uh, ability to, to listen and to hear and recognize voices that we who rely on our eyes do not have. He says, the Jewish people in the darkness of Purim were able to work on a new faculty, which we didn't have before. It didn't exist until this point. The ability to hear God, if you will, within the darkness, to recognize God during the darkness. Right? That was the ability they were able to pick up. That ability, actually, it's going to sound very weird, did not exist beforehand. It wasn't cultivated. But seeing God in the darkness and the difficulty and the challenges of Purim's story in Persia in that year actually developed a new thing inside us that actually was going to help us for the rest of Jewish history. And that was seeing God through the many difficulties and challenges that we would have. Now, we escaped at this point with our lives. At other points, we didn't. But this faculty was still developed at this point. Okay? Of recognizing God at difficult, dark times in Jewish history. So, appreciating God when things are going very, very well and you can see God is good. That's good. But what's harder to do and actually more important is to recognize God when things are in very, very difficulty, through great difficulty. And by that, it's on a personal, not just a national level, but on a personal level, right? You can't find something personal, it's personal tragedy. Finding God during times of personal tragedy, right? The Purim version in nature is considered much, much harder. Yeah. Um, I feel the opposite. I feel like when people are doing really well in life and they're just like on a high, they kind of forget about it. It's also time. true. When things are going very well, it's also very true. When things are going very, very well, yeah. right, it's also hard to reckon. That, I mean, that comes with its own challenge. And that comes with its own people challenge. Are well in life, they, like, they turn to someone to help them, so they turn to Hashem. Very good. Very, very good. That's exactly what they did. We learned that from the Purim story. Yeah. Yeah, seeing God, by the way, that's why open miracles don't prove anything. Or they prove very little. They really don't. Yeah. Right? Which proves, I mean, the obvious text proof of that is right after the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai after all the miracles they saw they still worshipped a golden calf didn't help you can see something know it yet not act upon it great great minds thinking alike I like that okay so important Do bottom of page 8 we're going to jump around so you've got to go with me bottom of page 8 so since this story has within it a certain blueprint that didn't exist before, but is going to be used afterwards, it ends up being that the Purim story is going to outlast all the other holidays. Even the Rambam is going to talk about this. But let's look at the Midrash. And the Midrash says, unmishly, Shekal All the Jewish holidays are going to be nullified. What's that? The Yemei Purim, Loyum Mirvat Leolam, however, the days of Purim not be Nidvatlin, they're not going to be nullified at all. You're always going to have Purim. When is it referring to? Mashiach. After Mashiach comes. After Mashiach comes, you're not going to need Pesach anymore. Pesach will not be an instrument of education. It's unusual. And actually, there's a proof of this in the book of Esther, chapter 9, verse 28. We may have Purim Ha'ela, Loya of Rumitoch Ayodim, is not going to be passed over, will never leave the Jewish people, and will never be lost to his children. Now, the word Le'olam is mentioned when it comes to the Jewish holidays as well, to be fair. But the Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 16, verse 14 to 15, we're on page 9, says, Lechem, Hine Yamim Bayim, days are coming. This is. Jeremiah the prophet talk about the days of Mashiach. No Hashem declares God. The Yamar, and no longer will it be said. Od Chai Hashem, Hashem let B'nei Yisrael Meretz Yisrael. This is the God who took us out of Egypt. Now we talk about that a lot. I mean, we have tons of mitzvot in the Torah that refer to this concept of why do we keep Tefillin, Shabbos, Pesach, Mezuzah, you name it. It's all Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim. Says the prophet Jeremiah, but those days are going to, they're numbered. They're going to end. Why? 
So he says, Ki im chai Hashem, Hashem lev b'nei Yisrael, mi'er tzafon mekol aros as Hashem hadicham shem ha'shvatam ala d'masom Hashem nesasi l'avosam. There's going to be a time within the country of the land of Israel with Mashiach. And those holidays are no longer to be pertinent. Because the miracles when Mashiach comes are going to be greater and you're not going to need Pesach anymore. The story of Pesach is no longer going to be the architect. It's still going to be mentioned, but the holiday itself is not going to be there anymore. It's not going to be needed. It's going to be overtaken by the coming of the Messiah. It's going to be overtaken by the coming of the Messiah. Let's have a look at the Ramchal in Das Tavunas. He's going to go through this. This is deep stuff, but it's pretty important. And he says, in every action that God performs in this world, we're on page 9, note 3. There's two things going on. Nirav and Nistar, revealed and hidden. God, either he's revealed or he's hidden. That's just the way it works. Hashem reveals himself or hides himself. Vanistar, the hidden, who eats a mukan him satamid beholdimilatav. That is constantly there. It's a deep design inherent in everything that God does. La vibehen atebriel latikon aklali. Hashem hiding himself in nature is not that just to upset us or irritate us. It's there to help us reach our eventual redemption and tikkun, the fixing of the world. She'ein lach maseh katun agadol because nothing small or big happens. She'ein tochir kavanatol etikon ashlem, which doesn't lead to God's ultimate perfection of this world. Ki adua derechav karev barachu. Because in the future, God, la'atid la'vol la'enei kol Yisrael, God is going to uh, let the Jewish people understand all the tochachot, the Assyrian, all the difficulties, all the challenges. La'yu ela hazmod l'tova, right? Which actually were done for our benefit. All the difficult stuff that happened when things were tough and challenging, nationally and even personally, it's going to be, oh, that's why it happened. That's why we went through suffering. That's why we went through this description. That's why we went through that Holocaust and that pogrom. It's all going to become very, very clear that all of it was painful and was darkness. And we couldn't see Hashem. We couldn't see God. But ultimately, it was all there for the ultimate redemption. We don't see that now. But it will become very, very, very evident at the end of days. Okay? Vehine, Ata, but now... We don't get what Hashem's doing. We're halfway through the novel. We're halfway through the movie. We can't see Hashem. We don't know what Hashem's doing. You always got to get to the last scene and then say, like, oh, that's why he was killed. And that's why that person got to... It all becomes very, very clear. It looks like this was a bad guy. It's actually a good guy. It doesn't seem good. It's actually very, very bad. At the end, the last page of the novel, you get to see exactly why Hashem did what he did. Right? That's the end of history. We get to see that. But when you're in the middle of the novel, you're in the middle of the movie, you don't get to see it. It's not evident because the plot is still building up and the characters need to develop. That was a good one, that one. Right? Ki hare atocha zeh shave bekulam shekulam rak tovelo rak klal zeh enu nirem uvan atavadai Right? It's not clear now, but it will be. Ach la tilavol, but in the future it will be understood. Everything will become very, very clear. All the different strategies and all the different things that occurred came came from Hashem's wondrous plans that were hidden in nature. Because it was when Hashem is hidden, when things are difficult, i.e. Purim story, we get to see it. So the Purim story is actually the proof text that ultimately everything works out well, even when you don't see it. Says the Sif Zechayim, that's why, page 10, that's why we can see, that's why we can see, me'ata navin heitev et divr chazal, kol amodim atil mitzvatel, we see that all of the holidays will be nullified. You won't need them anymore. Pesach will not be needed. We need Pesach now, because we still need to go free. But once we go free and Mashiach comes, it's not going to be needed anymore. That's what Jeremiah the prophet is saying. Pesach is done. Ah, Purim, but however, Purim lo yivatel won't be lost. Shnei mar v'zichrom lo yosif me'odam. 
it was never going to be nullified because for some reason that lesson is going to take us into and through Mashiach coming. It's going to be realized that that holiday has more power than Pesach itself, which is wild. Because Pesach happened in the Torah, Purim happened years later, right? And it's a rabbinic holiday, yet there's more depth to that than there is the Torah itself. And this should not be unusual for us. We see that sometimes Torah things take a back seat to non-Torah things, just like the Shema is a Torah mitzvah and is important. But the Amida is a rabbinic and was created by the prophets, and yet that's considered greater because we had to work at it. It took effort, so it's considered greater. Right? Not such a such a weird concept. We Jews consider the Torah sometimes secondary to our own efforts and our own realizations. Are we getting some depth over here? So he says, the common denominator between the Messianic revelations and the revelation of Purim, who Havan is understanding, that how all evil in the world helped serve to create a scenario that we can see God in this world. That's a very big, big lesson. That all the bad stuff that happens happen for a good reason. Now, sometimes we get to see it in our own lives. Bad stuff happens, we get to see it. But on a national scale, we haven't seen it yet. Not on a national scale. Personally, we say, oh, something bad happened. We've all had experience, right? Something bad happened, like, oh, that was actually very good. You know, I needed to go through that. We get to see little glimpses of this. But not on, on a national level. It's, it's, it's very, very hard. I mean, there's certain times when Hashem lifts up the corner of nature and a little bit of light shines out. You know? You get to see a little bit of it, you know? It's very, very small. But you get to see it compared to the scope of the badness, right? After the Holocaust, the Hashem coming and miracles that happened afterwards and giving a very Yisrael to the Jewish people. We get to see certain times that Hashem does a very, he's a very small glimpse. It's compared to the ultimate difference, it's going to be a complete revelation. It will all come very, very clear. Right? You can't compare a nice scene in the novel to the final page where it all just kind of like, you know what I'm saying? It all seemed everything was poor, everything was go around, it was all lottery, but then we see the whole thing come together. Right. This is just a hint to Hashem's revelation at the end of days. So that's what he says. So all the days of Purim are going to be nullified. Right? Because the outer temple is going to be so great. However, Purim is only going to get better. Meaning that from Pesach, as the years go by, it's like down, 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 down. Right? Till you get to the ultimate redemption. But Purim, we're going to appreciate it better at the end of the day. So it's, we appreciate Pesach now. When Shia comes, it's like, oh, we've seen better. But Purim right now may not seem so great, but it gets greater appreciation when Shia comes. Oh, now I get it. Now I get Purim. Uh, up to now, it's like a nice holiday. We got dressed up, read the Megillah. Okay, I got to see Hashem. But when Mashiach comes, it all kind of explodes and becomes even greater. That's when it's gonna. That's when you're gonna really appreciate it. That's what it means. That the memory will not be lost from his children, even after Mashiach comes. Good. <laughs> Let us change topics. We have everything on the board down? Important words. Nays, niggle, nays, nista, teva, nature, sink. Okay. Oh, okay. No, the back and front of this clean is exactly the same. It doesn't remove the chalk, it just redistributes it. Okay. Let's talk about, we should mention during the beginning itself, we're going deeper into these concepts. Let's talk about the concept of Amalek. Amalek. Who or what is Amalek? And why do they feature so strongly in the Purim story? Who are they? What are they? Why are they so bad? Actually, 
This is a very difficult question. I'll be very impressed if someone knows the answer to this question. Does anyone know? Um, go on. We're going to talk about that, yes. We're going to see that inside. There's a mitzvah in the Torah, a mitzvah in the Torah, non-related to this, where you see the root of the word Amalek. Where you see the root of this word. Is it a coincidence? No, actually, the word itself, the word, remember, if you find a word with another mention elsewhere, remember this? We, we can see it. It, it connects. This is tough. There is a mitzvah that a Kohen has where he grows out his nail. Right? The Kohen would have long, sharp nails. Actually, there's a, guy, a Kohen in my synagogue who actually has a sharp nail, a long thumbnail. He has a tradition in his family to keep his thumbnail long. Interesting enough for this reason. Called Malika. 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 So Malika, the Torah tells us, is one of the ways that the Kohen would kill a little bird that was used as a sacrifice in the Mishkan, in the base of Mignosh. Malika. And the Kohen would sharpen his thumbnail, extremely sharp, and go and through that action would cut through and the little bird would die immediately. Right? Immediate death. And then there were certain actions he would do with the blood and the feathers and all the rest of it. And so the rabbis say there's actually a connection between Malika and Amalek. Malika and Amalek. What would that connection be? Malika and Amalek. It's a tough one. Yeah. There is a mitzvah to wipe out Amalek. That is true. That is true. But then why not some other? Why does that appear over here? <coughs> so, Malika is a detachment of head from body. Malika was a detachment of head disconnected from body. A Malik represented this idea and their descendants. The head is, if you will, disconnected from the body. What does that mean? The body does bad. They kill, they want to hurt, maim, destroy. But they're not barbarians. Their heads are intact. They're disconnected. Their head is really smart. Not a bunch of Mongols running through just like slaughtering people randomly. They're smart, they're brilliant. This is one of the reasons that many rabbis of the day, and still to this day, to the Nazis epitomize this idea of a Malik in a number of ways, but this is one of them. They're very smart. They killed us in a very smart and calculated fashion. We don't know whether they were a Malik. Many people say they were conjectured. However, the, the nature of them is a Malik-like. Very smart, brilliant. They know, they think it through. Not a bunch of wild barbarians just slashing their way through. It's thought out. It's got a purpose. The head is separate. The guf and the moch are separate. The moch happens to be good. Where do we see this idea? Thank you. Where do we see this idea? Whose head was disconnected from his body? Asav, right. Asav is Amalek's great, 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 great grandfather. What happened to Asav? At the end of his life? His head was cut off, right? Hushim ben Dan, who was deaf, saw a fight going on, saw they weren't allowed him to bury the father, took out a knife and cut his head off. According to the rabbis, his head rolled into Marat HaMachbele. What does that mean, rolled in? Why? Because his head was good. He was smart. His head rolled in into Mar Machpelah. His head, but his goof, goofed. As my Rebbe, when I was a kid, used to say, his goof, goofed. His body wasn't allowed in. That was the source of trouble and pain and has been ever since. 
So a Malik is Malika. They're not stupid. They're not crazy. They're very well thought. They're wrong, and they're the epitome of evil, but it comes through a force of, of great genius that is totally mischanneled. Wait, are you saying they're smart? Or they're, they're I'm saying they're smart. smart. You could be smart and, and evil good? at the same... Not good. Oh, okay. You could be smart and evil at the same time. Because you said Asaph was smart. Asaph was smart. Yes, his head... He knew what he was doing. He knew how to say... The thing to say, how to say things. But his body ended up going the opposite direction. Okay. Let's have a look at this mitzvah of a malik. What it means to wipe out a malik. And why actually the final Amalek won't be removed until Mashiach comes. Actually, we're going to see, actually, not this semester, <laughs> but uh, next semester in the higher level course I teach, one of the proofs that Mashiach is Mashiach, he's got to prove himself, <coughs> one of the things he's got to do is to actually wipe out Amalek. One of the ways he proves he actually is Mashiach is by finishing what wasn't started many, many years before. Okay? Because Amalek are going to remain a thorn in our sight until the end of days. And Purim, as we just mentioned earlier, is proof to the end of days as well. Let's go back over to the Torah and let's see what it says. So in Devarim, Chafhei, chapter 25, verse 17 to 19, Zohar et Malik, remember what a Malik did to you. But Derech, on the way, but Sayyid when you came out of Egypt, Asher Karacha Derech, they happened upon you. Now we mentioned when we went through the Megillah, what a Malik represent? The happenstance. Kara. It's a karali. It just happened. What does that mean? There's no plan. There's no plan, no. It just happened. Right? Makara, what's going on? What's, what, what randomness? Right? They represent, they are the happenstance people. We're on page 12, note 3, looking at the Pesukim. Ashe karacha baderech. And they went, and what did they attack? They weren't stupid. They didn't attack the warriors at the front, they attacked the weak people at the tail end, at the Zanav. The weak and the elderly who at the back, they kill them. They know how to attack. They go for the weak, the infirm. Kol HaNechashalim, says the Torah, Acharecha, Vata'ayef, and you were very tired, V'yageya, the lawyer about Kelokim, and you weren't fearing God at this point, there was a spiritual blemish in you as well. This is the Torah, this is Hashem speaking. This is Moshe Rabbeinu speaking through Hashem right now. Therefore it's going to be when the Hashem has given you rest, Hashem gave us a nachla, when Hashem gives you rest from all your enemies, one thing you've got to do, you've got to wipe out these Amalekites. Right? They're going to come and attack you, they are so bad that when they come to attack you, and they, says the Rambam, by the way, when they come to attack you like a Malik does, if they don't come to attack you, this mitzvah may not actually be forced, but when they come to attack you and act like a Malik, you have to wipe them out. Timcha, right? Yamach, Shema, we say, right? To wipe out, to blot out any remembrance of a Malik. Mitachat Shemaim, Velotishkach, don't forget. This is a constant mitzvah, and Moshe Rabbeinu is telling them, when you go to Eretz Israel, they're going to come for you again. Jump to note 5. Jump to note 5. In note 5 we see that in the times of Samuel the prophet, Shaul had such a mitzvah to wipe out a malik, an opportunity. And Saul defeated a malik from Chavila to the approach of Shur, these two areas. Ashal Pene Mitzrayim, which is alongside Egypt. But he took Agag alive. Uh oh. That's not good. What did Moshe Rabbeinu tell you to do? Kill them all out. But he took what? Agag, the king of Amalek, took him alive. Not good. Not good. Later on, we see that Samuel the prophet got very upset. They also took the, the loot, and they weren't allowed to do that either. They actually said that later on in the Megillah, when they defeated all the enemy came to attack them, they didn't take the loot from the people who came to attack them, as to be attacking this mitzvah, over this Aveira over here, 
of taking the loot. They were told not to take any benefit from this attack of Amalek. There's nothing good in them. Don't take the loot. Which, by the way, when you fought a war, you always took the spoils of war. That's just the way it was. They were told not to. They still did. Later on, they paid by not doing it. Agag lived another night. He was able to procreate that one night. He was killed the next day by Shaul. Too late. The next generation was already put into play. So we see Agag appears in our Purim story. Bottom of page 12. So we see inside the Megillah that Haman came from Amalek. That's what we're dealing with. He put his seat upon all the princes who were there. He was extremely powerful. Okay. Look at Rav wrote about this and says something very interesting. It says Rav Soloveitchik, we're on page 13. What is the Torah saying to us about this idea of who are these Amalekites? The Amalekites Kamalan, they're still here. They're still here. They haven't been wiped out. We had opportunity. We missed an opportunity. Plan A was to wipe them out. Plan A wasn't fulfilled. Plan B was kicked in. So this this nature, this nature of Amalek is still here. The Tzera and Masha Torah, that's why the Torah says, in Shemot 17, 16, Milchamet like Milchamala, Hashem Amalek, Midor Vador. Every generation you have to deal with these people. Every generation. Im kein if shal Amalek, lem chos min olam ad bias. Hamashiach, right? You're not going to see the end until Mashiach comes. Right? As it says, Ein akise shalem, Hashem's throne is not shalem full. Ve'ein Hashem shalem, and Hashem himself, as it were, is not complete in this world. Ad shem chav zero shal Amalek, until Amalek is defeated. Hashem is not complete in this world. You're not going to fully know God while there's still this nation of Amalek and this nature of Amalek that is in the world. Okay? But where are they? Hatshuva. Where are this nation? Hatshuva, Shamati, Pamipi, Abamari. He learned this from Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, the Rav, says that he heard from his father. Kikol Uma, any nation, listen to this, unbelievable, this is mind blowing. Any nation, who contrives, who plans to alienate the entire Jewish people, according to Allah, Amalek. When they only want to wipe us out, not they want our land, not they want our money. They just want to wipe us out. Actually, it makes no sense to them to do it. Remember Haman? Haman was all money, all power. He could have kept it all. But his hatred for us was so much he was willing to gamble it all in order to wipe us out. That's Amalek. That is pure Amalek tendency. Which is why many people say the Nazis were Amalek. Because they had it all. They had all the power. They're fighting wars on all fronts against all of Europe, right? And the British were coming and the Americans, and yet they were still diverting their money, time, and attention to killing Jews, right? I mean, it just didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. It's a crazy desire just to wipe us out. That's a Malik. Were they a Malik? You've got to say some of them were. It's just too accurate, yeah. I feel like they weren't a Malik because, like, that wasn't their only We're not saying that Amalek were nice to everyone else. They could have been evil to others as well. But their raison d'etre, the final solution was the Jews. We're not saying they were like friends to everyone else. It could be they made you know, alliances along the way. But that hatred for the Jewish people, that he wanted to uproot the entire Jewish people in the world, it's, it's got a Malik stamp on it. Where they were, we're not gonna know. Until Mashiach comes, we're not gonna be clear. But it's got a certain stamp on it that's then. As opposed to other nations that, you know, just wanna hurt us because they wanna take our money or our land. I remember I was in Yeshiva, and there was a Rebbe in Yeshiva, who has since passed away, Rav Bullman. And there was an attack in Eretz Yisrael, we're going back 20 years ago, 
time of the Intifada, whatever it was, many, many years ago. And I was in the base Midrash, and I was a Bachar in Yeshiva, a very, very great rabbi. He's written a number of books. And uh, there was an attack, and there was an explosion, had some bus had blown up, I don't know what it was, but a lot of Jews got killed at that time. And it was Friday night, and I forget this. And he got very, very emotional, and he said, I know it's Shabbos, you should discuss things on Shabbos, he said, because we're, you know, should be happy. And he said, people who do this, it could be seeds of a monarch within other nations. That there, it's, he was obviously very emotional, but he said, this way of attacking Jews, right, through suicide killings, to give my own life, that's a malik. And a malik committed suicide to kill us. When they came to get us, when we left the Mitzrayim, that was a suicide mission. They knew they were going to win. They knew they were going to be defeated. And Rashi actually gives a interesting metaphor in the Chumash on this, on the word karcha. The word karcha means happenstance, but the word kar means cold and he says it's like a bath a really hot bath the first person that jumps in gets burnt and they know they're going to get burnt but what happens right afterwards they absorb the water and karafa the water cools down says Rashi so other people can enter in see when the Jewish people left Mitzrayim left Egypt we were on a high everyone was scared of us they were all terrified of the Jewish people what did Amalek do they jumped into the bath they got burnt, and they knew they were going to get burnt. They, they killed themselves so that other people would be able to come along to attack us. And the heat of the Jewish people was lessened during that time. Now, we don't see a Malik nowadays. Or if we do, we don't recognize who they are. But there is another aspect, and we mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. A Malik has a gematria, a numerical value. What's the numerical value of a Malik? Count it up for me. Iron is. Come on. Iron is 70, right? Mem is. 40. Lamed is. Thank you. Kuf is. 100. What does that come to? Thank you. 240. It's actually the number bus. I used to have to take to school every day. Which made sense, actually. Go to my yeshiva. That's a good one. Right? That was 240. There's another word we said which has the same gematria, which is suffake doubt. So Chazal, through the gematria of 240, connect these two. And they say that what do we see of Amalek now? Doubt. They so doubt that it's all coincidence. It's all poor. This whole world is unclear. It's not, we don't know, we're not sure. Is God with us? Is God not with us? Right? Can I see Hashem? I don't believe. What did our Malik create? Atheism. They were the first, maybe the individuals beforehand, but they were the first nation. I mean, there was no play of idol worship that existed before our Malik. Uh, but atheism, really, they formed it. They, idea of it's all suffix, everything's in doubt. Right, that's a malik. A malik of the they sow the seeds of doubt into creation, into the world. That's what they're really doing, and that is the curse of a malik. That only gets fixed up when we know for sure that Hashem when Mashiach comes. Mashiach's job is going to clarify Hashem's hand right through Jewish history. He's gonna complete that, and that's why he has to be the ultimate defeater of a malik. There's some, right? The obvious, there's many, many bad people. But that's not, um, it could be. It could be individuals within them. All the nations are mixed up. But that's not them. They're believers. They're bad. Really bad. Like mega, mega, really bad. But that's not them. So that's Amalek not them. Amalek has to, like, Amalek is people who don't believe in God. Amalek epitomizes the idea of atheism. Yes. Yes. That's what they introduced to the world. Yeah. Like all the I hear you saying they're doing it for a higher cause. I hear. I don't know. I don't know. I said I can't tell you for sure. I can't tell you for sure. It doesn't seem to be, although Rabbi Bullman said seemed to hold like that. I remember that was more of an emotional uh, concept, but the idea still stands. Killing just the sake of killing. And wiping out Jewish people against logic, 
is an Amalekite tree. Right? It's a it's a seed of a Malik in this world. Okay. We did a lot today. We'll pick this up next class, God willing. Thank you. You're welcome.